G'day, May 40 here. So why on earth did Joe Biden go visit Israel in a time of war? No other U.S. president has visited a site of, of war when the war is still going on, let alone a war for other countries. I mean, what on earth was uh, Joe Biden <laughs> doing in, in Israel? Like, during a time of war, it's insane, it's inexplicable. So here's how I understand it. Either Joe Biden understands some things that no other United States president has ever understood, but he has a wisdom and a perception that no other United States president has possessed, or there's just something unique about this situation that just calls for an American president to go visit it right now. The only other leading American politician who I could think of who might do something like this is Donald Trump, which is why Steve Saylor keeps talking about how Joe Biden is the most Trumpian of all American politicians aside from Donald Trump. I mean, there's no good strategic American reason for Joe Biden to go visit Israel during a time of war. It was just pure ego that endangers the United States. It was against American best interests. It was similar to Nancy Pelosi visiting Taiwan. Right? That was not in Taiwan's interest. It was not in America's interest. It endangered both Taiwan and the United States, but it felt good for Nancy Pelosi's ego. And for Joe Biden to visit Israel at this time, well, I guess it must have felt good for his ego, but it, it's hard to imagine like how on earth did that, that do any actual good for America or for Israel or for, for Gazans to show up there at a time of war. So either Joe Biden possesses a wisdom that no other American president has, or this situation is unlike any other situation that's ever presented to an American president, or he's doing this for extraneous, probably egotistical reasons. Right? You may be wondering, how is Thomas Baden Reese doing? Tell you, I wanted to tell you about how insanely happy I am and how insanely happy I've been away from all this YouTube political crap, really. Because I, 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 lots of people in our movement or in our circles talk about the need for people to develop an inner life, to be, you know, to have a good spiritual life. But I will say that my spiritual life, my, my inner life is A-OK. -okay. It is perfect. I doubt there is a person more content on this planet than I am. I am seeking change. There isn't one. There isn't a change yeah, around the corner. We're in this total limbo state. You see, we can't, the, the, the van isn't going to fall over the edge of the cliff, but at the same time, it's not going to um, get, get out of its precarious situation and drive off over the horizon. That's not going to happen either. So you're just left in this limbo state. And it's really annoying because at least at the beginning of COVID, we could predict the agenda and things seem to make sense. But the longer and longer this has gone on, the more difficult it, it appears to decode the agenda. And of course, playing into all of this is the fact that my predictions were wrong. And I said, I said there would be a collapse by last summer and there hasn't been. And that was keeping me going. You know, in the first year and a half of COVID, that was what's kept me going. And then it didn't happen. And then some people say, wow, I mean, how empty must his life be that his, his whole reason to keep going in life, to keep living, is his prediction is to see his prediction fulfilled that everything's going to fall apart. But I am stream sniping Stephen J. James here. Said, well, Thomas, it'll happen by Christmas, but it didn't. It didn't happen by Christmas. We're now in January. So, well, we're essentially coming into February, in fact. So where is it going to happen? It, when, where, when, is, when, is, when is the collapse going to happen? I don't believe it is. Of course, there's always stories in the media, which make you think, ooh, this could go somewhere, like the Kazakhstan story, for example. But where the hell do these things go in the end? They go nowhere. And so you're left in this limbo state. You're left in the limbo state. Okay. I will tell you now, my big, one of my big productions is about the destruction of Israel in September of 2022. And still in this, at this stage, even though I'm saying all oh, my predictions would be wrong, I'm still kind of thinking, ooh, you know what? It could still happen by then. So, you know, but I wanted to say, if it doesn't happen by then, I, I will definitely then kind of go away 
until such a time is 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 there is an emergency situation. And I'm- quite a loss, quite a loss for for the rest of us. Okay, supposedly this uh, this photo from a pro Palestinian rally in Warsaw has shocked the world. We've identified the young woman in the photo. Meet Marie Anderson. She's a Norwegian medical student at the Medical University of Warsaw. Fifth year student. She hails from Oslo, Norway. She's married to a Jordanian. Okay, so it's normal, natural, and even healthy that people just instinctively side with their own team. And she's just siding. She's adopting her husband's team and just instinctively siding with her husband's team. I don't think there has to be a lot more to it than than that. So you probably heard about that rocket that fell on a hospital in Gaza. And the the ironic thing, the fascinating thing, is that this rocket, right, with this misfired rocket by Palestinian Islamic Jihad, it probably achieved more this past week than Hamas succeeded with all its successful missile launches. This is an opinion from Israeli columnist Nacham Barnier. Right? So sometimes you succeed more with a failure than you do with a, a success, because even with this failure of Palestinian Islamic Jihad sending a rocket into its own hospital, they managed to galvanize Arab Muslim opinion against Israel and forestall any Joe Biden meetings with leading Arab leaders, because this is what happens during in time, times of intense conflict, right? intense emotion. People just behave in a primal tribalistic fashion, which is probably normal, natural, and most times healthy. Let's get a little bit more on this. Wall Street Journal. On October 17th, an explosion occurred in the courtyard of al Ahli Arab Hospital in Gaza City, killing civilians. Palestinian officials blamed Israel, but a visual analysis by the Wall Street Journal shows that the explosion was caused by a failed rocket launched from inside Gaza, where Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad have been shooting rockets into Israel since the war began two weeks ago. At around 6.59 p.m. local time, four cameras capture the moments before and after the incident. The journal geolocated and verified the timing of the footage and mapped each camera's vantage point. Camera one, a live feed webcam located just south of Tel Aviv, looks south at Gaza. Camera two, a surveillance camera in Israel near the northern border of Gaza, also facing south. Camera three, a live streamed Al Jazeera news broadcast in western Gaza faces east. And camera four, a bystander cell phone video just southeast of the hospital where the explosion occurred. With this combined view, we can see the failed rocket launch and resulting explosion. At about 6.59, camera two near the Gaza border shows what rocket experts say is a barrage of short-range rockets, likely capable of traveling between 12 and 25 miles, being launched from western Gaza northeast toward Israel. Then, about 20 seconds later, we see what experts say is a long-range rocket launched from Gaza. The rocket was launched in a northeastern trajectory toward Israel. Ten seconds after launch, a tiny flash of light is seen, and the rocket starts to veer back west. The flash and change in trajectory are consistent with a failed rocket, not with Israel's Iron Dome defense system shooting it down. Weapons experts the journal spoke to say this change in trajectory is caused by the explosion of the rocket motor. In camera three, the Al Jazeera footage, facing east, we can see this minor explosion. Then, a trail of fire spreads as the motor blast ruptures the rocket casing and ignites the fuel. The rocket heads west, in the direction of camera three, with a hospital in its path. Fifteen seconds after launch, the rocket fails completely and breaks apart. There's a small explosion on the ground, then a second, larger explosion at the site of the hospital. A nearby resident captures the moment of impact facing northwest toward the hospital. Fire engulfs the courtyard and burns for an extended period. Experts say the large fire is likely due to the amount of fuel still in the rocket just after launch. 
Explosives experts who reviewed the blast footage and photos of the aftermath see further evidence that the failed rocket was the cause of the explosion on the ground. This crater shows an impact pattern coming from the east, in line with the rocket's path. The shallowness of the crater is also consistent with impact from a failed rocket. Experts say the cars closest to the impact crater were likely hit with fragments from the rocket, causing one to explode and burning several others. These marks next to the crater and damage to the buildings show that the fragments from the impact flew across the grassy areas where civilians were sheltering. Failed rockets are not uncommon in the long-standing conflict between Hamas and Israel. The United Nations determined that in the 2022 flare-up between the two sides, 20% of rockets fired from Gaza failed and in three cases likely resulted in large numbers of civilian casualties. Hey, interesting video there from the Wall Street Journal. I will share the link. So meanwhile, while I grab that link, you're probably wondering what's going on with decoding the gurus. Here they are speaking to extremism researcher Julia Ebner. What type of personality is, extra is attracted to religious and political extremism? Yeah, definitely. I would say immersed myself is actually the, the term I now prefer to use because it's the most kind of anthropological term I can think of. <laughs> um, but yeah, in my kind of in these immersion experiences, I, I definitely encountered a lot of individuals who'd gone down the radicalization spiral because of some kind of identity crisis. A lot of them were, I guess, rooted in traumatic childhood experiences or some kind of traumatic and, and transformative experience that happened early on in their life. So in other words, they are lonely people and attaching yourself to some sort of extremist or, or cult group is a way to find personal connection. And it's probably the same reasons exactly drive people to watch a lot of live streams. Lives, but some of them would also just have, have something come up during their teenage years or later on in life where they went through identity crisis in one shape or form that can be in the form of a masculinity crisis. I would even say I also encountered women with what I would call femininity crisis. We don't even talk about that very much because we mostly talk about masculinity crisis. But there were also a lot of questions these women posed about their role in society, about womanhood and and yeah, and questions like that. For example, when I joined female misogynist communities, which is really which sounds like an oxymoron, but these women do exist and they glorify even things like domestic violence and hyper-conservative family and family models. And We, um, we recently talked about Pearl Davis, so <laughs> the, unfortunately <laughs> familiar <laughs> yeah. with yeah. that side yeah. of the pool. That's, yeah, yeah. But a lot of them in general, I would say whether I looked at Islamist extremists in ISIS networks or at neo-Nazis or misogynist communities, it was very often that sense that they they felt like they... Yeah, people want to feel alive. People want to feel connected. And so some people find that through getting drunk, doing drugs, watching porn, or doing all of those things and joining some sort of extremist or cult-like group. It needed to look for some new form, very strong form of group belonging. And very often, I mean, a lot of them were also driven by some some deeper sense of loneliness or lacking kind of social connection in their in their real lives and they found that in these new communities in these new groups where often these groups then become almost like family replacements and they even talk in, in kinship language to each other so yeah i think that was a commonality on a on a psychological level i julia there's a we were recently talking to the hosts of the Conspirituality podcast and they were asking our opinions about this kind of age-old debate amongst researchers and amongst public intellectuals about the role of ideology versus the role of social factors, deprivation or geopolitical things and psychological characteristics of individuals. Like what is the dominating factor or what's the mix in there and and obviously have people like sam harris that have like quite strongly argued for ideology as the key component and other researchers arguing that uh, psychological and social factors are more significant and i i'm curious from your work 
what you think about that mix uh, and if there are is if there is any ingredient that is particularly potent in pushing people towards extremist groups yeah yeah all i mean most of today's evidence suggests that ideology alone cannot really drive extremism that it's usually a combination of different factors and ideology or narratives are often just an outlet for personal struggles for this is this is exactly right ideology and, and religion po po extreme politics extreme sports are often just an an outlet for personal frustrations psychological crisis so it's usually a combination of of there is a, a kind of a personal grievance or a personal there are different psychological factors that that play a big role and that then are channeled towards an ideology which is also why there are so many similarities across different ideologies i in my first book the rage i examined the parallels between Islamist extremism and far-right extremism. And there are so many, there are so many parallels in terms of the radicalization pathways of individuals, but also in terms of the narratives, where you always have the same type of narrative and you can just replace certain words with others and you essentially have the same ideology, like uh, Muslims are at war with the West or the West is at war with Muslims, or there is an inevitable conflict of races, cultures, and religions. Yeah, she, she makes some good points. There are some inherent conflicts in certain situations between different races and different religions, but in different situations, the conflicts are not nearly as intense. All right, Ricardo has joined the chat. He says, Jignats, meaning Jewish nationalists, are succumbing to the dangers of the e-personality, marginalized losers sharing their genocidal fantasies online. So if you're sharing genocidal fantasies online, particularly in an identifiable way, that is something that's going to get you socially marginalized. I remember just walking down the street just outside of Beverly Hills, and this uh, Israeli guy starts yelling, death to the Arabs. And I was like, whoa. Now, this guy didn't have a prestigious job. All right, he had the kind of job that uh, you essentially can't be canceled from. But uh, yeah, sh sharing any kind of genocidal fantasy uh, online is is not going to usually result in a happy, healthy, successful life. Uh, Ricardo says the people of color are not going to let them indulge their violent anti-social tendencies. Well, someone making a tweet, all right, uh, that's usually as far as it's going to go. So this idea that uh, people of color are not going to allow Jews to tweet or to express uh, their opinions uh, online, that's absurd. Am I going to bring on Kristen Ruby for Frame Game Conspiracy Theories? Don't know who Kristen Ruby is. I want to hear more about Elliot's plan to save the Palestinians by deporting them to Madagascar. Well, I'm a Zionist. I, I support the, the Jewish state. I want the Jewish state to prosper and the existence of Palestinians who hate it right next to it it's obviously a grave danger to the Jewish state. So, yeah, I would love the Palestinians to up and move. I would love them to go to Jordan. I would love them to go to Egypt. But I understand why Jordan, Egypt, and other surrounding Arab Islamic nations don't want to bring them in because, one, they would be acceding to essentially what was the ethnic cleansing that uh, prepared the way for the modern state of, of Israel, and, two, the... Arab Islamic nations surrounding the Palestinians don't see any benefit to them from importing them. So I expect Egypt and, and Jordan to want to act in their own better interests. Ricardo says, Jignats better be careful. They're not in control anymore. People of color led protests happening even with no media support. Well, on American college campuses, uh, that's probably where you get more of a reflection of overall first world experiences than in the rest of America. That's where you have the ro most robust criticism of Israel and where you have Arabs and Muslims feeling most comfortable with you know, showing the flag for their side. So I don't think that uh, what's going on at American college campuses is you know, some great uh, shame that you have Arabs and Muslims you know, rallying and showing the flag for, for their side. I expect in a time of conflict, People on either side will just instinctively side with their team. and They're not going to try to think about things in some kind of hyper-objective way. The pets are off their leash, biting their owners. Well, uh, 
Jews are still about 1.5% of the population of the United States. They have a great deal of uh, influence and uh, agency and expertise in the United States, so they tend to punch above their numbers in many different areas. I don't think uh, Jews are going to disappear from public life in America. American Jews are usually irrelevant in what terms? <laughs> I mean, if you're t talking in terms of economics, no, they're not irrelevant. If you're talking in terms of education, they're not irrelevant. In terms of culture, they're not irrelevant. But in playing for the Dallas Cowboys offensive line, yeah, they are irrelevant. So I'm irrelevant to 99.99999% of humanity. And I suspect that you are equally irrelevant to 99.9999% of humanity, but we both have people who love us. Baruch Hashem. These narratives, these kind of overall threat narratives and apocalyptic ideas are very often inherently part of, of extremist ideologies. What now in my in my latest research, and I guess, I mean, Chris, you're very, very much familiar with that, having been involved in that research as well. But what kind of shows up as the most, I guess, significant trait or the most significant characteristic in radicalization pathways towards violence is is a mix of identity fusion. So when the personal group, when the personal identity becomes one with the group identity, but also then dehumanizing and demonizing labels that are applied to the out group. And that is, of course, inherently often inherently part of an extremist ideology. It's not just part of an extremist ideology. It's a normal, natural, and to, to a de degree, depending on the circumstance, can be you know, even healthy. All right, in times of extreme stress, all right, we don't tend to have a great deal of empathy for the outgroup. All right, so lack of empathy for outgroups or having a part of ourselves deep down inside who regards outgroups as subhuman is pretty much a universal part of the human condition. Now, people who are aligned with extremist politics or with cults, all right, they, they came to these extreme positions from a place of loneliness, disconnection. They are therefore more likely to manifest their psychosocial wounds in a more blatant manner than people who have things to lose. If you like, for example, the great replacement idea mm. or, or jihadist ideologies that would already have that <clears throat> demonization narrative as an integral part of, of what, what their framework is, is standing for. And then okay, violence condoning. Add, uh, Duvid to the show. I saw Duvid that a, a president of a, a synagogue in uh, Detroit was killed. You, do you know anything about this story? Yeah, God forbid. Shocking. I mean, uh, I, I know the woman. I, I was friend with the friends with the woman for uh, ten years. I remember the first time she walked in there, and uh, you know, she led to went on to become president. Um, as far as the story, there's no knowledge of why it happened or motive. I mean, God forbid she was found on the street, stabbed multiple times, and uh, there was a trail of blood going back to her apartment, and the police believe that the stabbing happened in her apartment. And there's no known motive, um, and the police are have not determined whether, you know, God forbid it was a hate crime or uh, a robbery. And also she's a very active political activist. She, you know, she helped uh, campaign for Dana Nessel. She's one of the leaders of the Democratic Party, Dana Nessel, the uh, attorney general, you know, the uh, very anti-Trump uh, lesbian woman, pro-abortion. She also worked for Elisa Slotkin, Hillary Clinton, and uh, she's friends with Rashida Tlaib. Uh, and there was another like two politicians, activists uh, killed in Detroit in the last few weeks. So there's also speculation that there could be some, that, that it could be connected to her political, act, political activity. And that could be anything like, you know, God forbid uh, abortion, uh, uh, pro-life or any uh, political wacko. But uh, it's tough to say, like, typically like guns are very easy to come by. So if it was just a regular robbery, um, they probably would have came with a gun, not a knife. Uh, 
but, you know, like like I said, like, like everyone has a gun in Detroit. It's not very hard to get one. Um, so like, God forbid, just a bunch of unknowns. And it's made the national media, um, you know, because of the war and speculation that has something to do with the war. And, uh, you know, so God forbid. And what, how dangerous is that area where she was living? I think she's probably relatively safe. Um, I mean, it's like a gentrified area, apartment complex. I mean, there's always risk everywhere in Detroit. You know, generally, um, you know, there's about 400 murders in Detroit a year, uh, sometimes like three to 400, about 75% of them go unsolved. About 90% of those murders are black on black crime. So, uh, you, you know, not, like non blacks being killed in Detroit is not actually that common, although it's a very dangerous place in general. And what can you tell me about the synagogue that she was the president of? Um, well, it was the only synagogue that lasted the, uh, you know, the 67 uh, riots revolution where the Jews basically fled to uh, the suburbs. And that was for multiple reasons. Possibly it had African-American converts that held it together. And it was like a businessman, Mincha Minion. So even though the Jews had moved out, that there's still a lot of Jews who worked in Detroit and they had a Mincha Minion uh, that uh, kept it around. And it was historically Orthodox. And then it switched to conservative uh in the early 2000s they'd even tried to like sell the building the and they they were disallowed like illegally uh they weren't able to like sell the building and keep the profit and uh and then a few people got involved in trying to renovate the synagogue bring it back together i was one of the early people and i had wanted to make an orthodox pinion and uh you know do it in like a more orthodox Hasidic style but that was not popular and uh you know, we had many in a while there were jews coming um and, and i you know accepted the liberalism so we just prayed there were there were women and it was mostly liberal and uh after about five ten years of uh you know trying to rebuild it up and there was enough of a jewish presence there through democratic processes they basically went liberal social justice um hired a reform rabbi uh you know, Harvard alumni, female, um, and, and turned it uh, away from, you know, they canceled Morning Minion for years. Like I woke up and drove to Detroit early, uh, just, I think it was just Thursday that we did it, but tried to make a Thursday Morning Minion. I went there Friday nights in the summer and, uh, you know, I, I, I helped create a lunch and learn and like brought in speakers. I'd even made, like, you know, donations. I'd spoke lunch and learn. And, uh, people weren't really interested in the Torah and uh, classical Judaism. So once there was enough of a Jewish presence, presence, they went liberal and uh, you became like a social justice synagogue and they got like a whole bunch of money, like, uh, like five, six million dollars from foundations. Um, the rabbi's like a Wexner scholar. Uh, this woman, Sam Wool, is has Orthodox family. So she was one of the few women that actually knew how to lead services. She had went to like a conservative Jewish day school. I actually go, her uncle goes to Young Israel. I, I was friendly with her uncle who also was like a chazan and lead services at Young Israel. So she was uh, a prayer leader and uh, you know, had Orthodox family. And uh, although she tiered liberal in, in the sense, like she would go in where yarmulke lead prayer services um her politics are unclear like she was a rising star in the democratic party um but she was also a member of the ajc so she was friends with Rashida Tlaib. she didn't go all the way left like uh jewish boys for peace or if not now and like being pro-palestinian um, but all, all the other issues like you know like abortion feminism uh immigration uh economic justice uh you know she was a full-time uh, leftist activist and, and she was big time like you could see all the papers uh, publishing her name um you know, like even hakeem jeffries the congressional staffer i mean she was considered a congressional staff staffer so it could be some sort of uh you know not even just anti-semitism a targeted political assassination now jews have uh complicated relations with with blacks i'm just trying to think off off the top of my head in some ways that 
that Jewish reactions to, to blacks are different from those of non-Jewish whites with similar education and levels of IQ. So it seems to me that Jews typically lead white flight when, when blacks move into a neighborhood, yet uh, Jews seem to be a little bit more pro-civil rights than your... So I'm not sure they're more pro-civil rights than, than whites with the same level of IQ and university education. Uh, Jews tend to be more more likely to shy away from physical confrontation than uh, than your your typical white person uh Jews <coughs> often find it fa- particularly orthodox Jews find it you know fascinating frequently to talk about blacks uh it, you know it can be a topic that can engage you know 20 30 40 you know minutes an hour so Jews in, in America used to typically employ blacks as servants until they switched to Hispanics in the last 30 years or so when when you account for the same level of IQ and the same level of secular education, what differences, if any, would you see between the way that uh, Jews relate to blacks and the way that non-Jewish whites relate to blacks? Well, yeah, I mean, Jews kind of fulfilled that management position, and 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 uh, you know, so she was a democratic activist and pushing political things, and kind of rose as a leader and you know obviously you know she was probably making a bunch of money and uh you know relatively upper middle class and uh you know had just these huge amounts of funding for her various uh activities uh i mean there's been a trend like what you were talking about i said that jews fleeing the urban areas for the suburbs and we've talked about that before where i said like basically all jews live in blue areas um, because Jews could only flee so far. They, they're, they're connected to the urban areas, and basically all urban areas now are multicultural, and Jews typically are not going to go all the way into the red area. So like in Metro Detroit, the fleeing into the suburbs has hit a hard stop. Like they're not Jews are not continuing to move further out. And in the last decade, there's been a return for Jews to try to Rego into cities and things like gentrification is not typically orthodox, although the orthodox might join in gentrification at some point once it's been successful. So like Duvid or, or Sam were on the front lines of the return for, for Jews because you know, like she actually was living in Detroit and, uh, you know, because orthodox Jews need the community structure in place. They need a minion and the kosher services. Uh, however, you would find individual Jews, uh, but uh, you have the gentrification um, aspect and it's very difficult uh, for Jews because if I'm going to Metro Detroit, like I, like I don't want to be average with the blacks because like the blacks, God forbid, that live in uh, below the poverty line, the average black, and uh, it has a much lower education level. So typically, the Jews end up in the gentrified area, trying to be management, and then there's the uh, you know, the savior complex, where are you really? benefiting the black people by moving in and like the democratic leadership and trying to uh you know, be leaders in the community or do blacks actually do better um having their own leadership controlling their own cities than uh, you know so to say like putting jews in charge of them and so it's also remotely possible if it was a, a black crime as opposed to which would be the most likely i mean statistically uh you, you know it's probably over 90 percent that it was a black who uh, who killed her, although there's no knowledge. But I'm just saying, just on the demographics and uh, you know, who commits murders in Detroit, uh, whether it was motivated or something like that, or whether it could have even been a political statement, like you Jews are not going to come back in here into the city and take control of our city, um, like even if you're nice and you're smart. But uh, um, I mean, because she was nice and smart, but also she was Democratic leadership who was basically trying to force like a liberal agenda. Or you know, tell the blacks what's best for them. And is uh, Detroit on any sort of trajectory right now? Is it improving? Is it getting worse? Staying the same? We had the white mayor Mike Duggan, who actually married an Arab, Arab woman, and there was after the bankruptcy and the ousting of the mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, who was you're just like taking bribes and doing unethical things in Detroit. Um, then you had Mayor Dave Bing, former basketball player, and there was a rise of more non-white, more more uh, non-blacks moving into Detroit, gentrification, 
uh, business coming, and, and there was politics and disputes with uh, the black majority about how good that was, but it was generally going in the more direction of more multiculturalism, immigration, uh, gentrification, and then COVID-19 hit, and uh, it largely put a stop to uh, the non-black uh, migration into Detroit, and since then it's been at a little bit of a standstill. So you could see like the Jews are basically part of the gentrification, like the downtown synagogue just like spent six million dollars to build like uh you know re revamp, re revamp the building there's been a few like apartment buildings so in the gentrified area it's extremely expensive like apartments are like new york prices it costs like two thousand dollars um a month for rent and then if you go a mile or two out uh, you still have abandoned houses and uh the standard of life like like saying that you know like uh, I, I used to talk about the price of lunch so like the price of lunch in the gentrified area is going to be like, you're going to have to spend like $15, $20 on lunch. However, your, your average uh, African-American in Detroit, like at a, at a cheaper diner, they want to spend like four or $5 on lunch. So, so uh, it's probably the same in LA um, in some neighborhoods with like gentrification and uh, a newer batch of liberal Jews, un you know, university graduates. And uh, you know, also the last aspect, you know, what type of jobs do Jews do? So there's a lot in the medical profession. A lot of the banking is still headquartered in the urban areas in the medical profession. And then there's a lot of non-for-profits. So like of the Jews in Detroit, almost like half of them work for non-for-profits. And, you know, so they're, they're somewhat being funded by outside sources that are pushing for uh, gentrification. Okay, let's uh, welcome Rodney to the show. Rodney, what, what are you seeing in the news these days that's grabbing your attention? Well, I don't think we should uh, assume. Uh, by the way, is my, my uh, sound okay, Luke? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, great. Um, I don't think we should assume that the stabbing, uh, this uh, uh, that Dubit's talking about, has anything to do with what's going on in the Middle East. I mean, I think it's kind of funny that everybody's talking about anti-Semitism. You know, uh, Joe Biden talked about it. A lot of the Democratic members of Congress have been talking about it. But a lot of these people that are now decrying it have been, shall we say, interestingly silent when Jews have been attacked by black people in broad daylight on the streets of New York, which has been going on, what, two, three years now, Luke? Which we see it, you know, quite a bit. And there's been, you know, been crickets, even from people, you know, say, take New York, for instance, Jerry Nadler. Uh, the last Jewish congressman, I believe, in uh, in uh, the New York area, um, New York City, uh, remarkably silent. And uh, Schumer, the same thing. We didn't uh, hear anything from them. And of course, now we see. Uh, and then on the on the right, we had decries of censorship and free speech and all that. And now they're actually in canceling, and now they're wanting people canceled who don't tow their APAC talking line. So what I've gotten out of this whole mess, you know, since the uh, uh, attacks in Israel, has been a whole lot of hypocrisy on both sides uh, of the aisle. Where was all the big league uh, Democratic politicians? Where they've been for two years while Jews have been attacked in major U.S. cities? Uh, by, let's just say, a more important constituent in their party. It's kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, Republicans not not too long ago was talking about we shouldn't censor anybody. Everybody should have free speech. Nobody should be canceled and denied a job if, you know, for free speech. And yet they're calling just for that. They're wanting these kids that are protesting on campuses. And you know, I don't agree with all of those protests. Kids do dumb things when they're young. We all did. Uh, but should that, should they have to carry that proverbial cross for the rest of their career? But that's used to be the, that used to be the argument of conservatives when, when the left would dig out a 25 year old statement or a 10 year old tweet from somebody and, you know, use it to get them fired. So it's just, you know, the hypocrisy, the emotionally charged oversimplifications, you know, the fact that we've not learned anything from, you know, 50 years of this mess. And uh, we're, it's probably going to get a whole lot uh, uh, worse before it gets better. 
Uh, from the war point of view, I think Israel's in a conundrum. If they go into Gaza proper, they're facing a Stalingrad type of situation, and it'll probably lick Stalingrad look like a, a cakewalk because Hamas has had how many years to tunnel that place and set booby traps. There'll be a sniper in, uh, you know, in every burned out or blown up building rubble like it was in Stalingrad. And uh, there'll be uh, more suicide bombers than what they can handle. So I think they're, they have a lot of trepidation about going into an urban warfare situation where there's 2 million you know, people, maybe more. And then up on the northern border, Hezbollah is a different animal. And I, I seem to remember the last time Israel had an outing with Hezbollah, it wasn't a smashing success by by any means and uh, so i think there are people really need to hold their breath now you know these these reports of you know hostages being taken civilians you know i've said on your show a lot of times that uh there's no more cowardly act than to target civilians by either side and that's what's that's what's happening here and the bigger question is how much how big of you know how how much pound of flesh how many pounds of flesh does israel want uh, they've now killed probably the same amount on each side. Uh, Hamas took out 13, maybe 13, 1,400 Israelis. Uh, there's probably been equal to or the same amount of Palestinians now in Gaza has been killed. How far does this have to go before it spirals out of control? I mean, uh, you know, World War I was started over something like this. And uh, interesting, the, the excuse that they did this to break up uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel's, you know, establishing diplomatic relations. I'm not really buying that because Saudi Arabia promptly came out on the side of, of the Palestinians. And if they were that close uh, to establishing relations, if it was that important, at least to the Saudis, they could have just said nothing and uh, it wouldn't have mattered. But the fact that they just almost immediately, they were one of the first two that basically blamed uh, blamed Israel and uh, also the propaganda, the statements going back and forth. People seem to forget that uh, in wartime, both sides lie. I don't take anything as gospel from the uh, uh, Israelis, uh, no pun intended. And I don't think I don't take anything from Hamas as gospel, no pun intended there either, because both sides lie. You know, we've heard about decapitated babies, but we certainly haven't seen evidence that was reported from one IDF soldier to one foreign correspondence, and it seemed to take root. I remember back in the first Gulf War when Iraqis were accused of dragging babies out of uh, out of incubators, and that turned out to be a bold-faced lie. The crying uh, Kuwaiti uh, that was crying before Congress turned out to be the daughter of an Iraqi opposition person in the United States and had never even been to Iraq. She'd been born in the United States. So... You know, I think people jumping uh, on this to gin up, you know, thing. Nikki Haley, for instance, she's been absolutely repulsive. She wants to run out and show her manhood by, uh, you know, getting more uh, other people's kids and grandkids to, to die for a foreign cause. Where really, we have no interest uh, there. And I also remember Benjamin Netanyahu during the Obama administration standing in Congress when he was invited to address Congress when Obama was working out the Iran deal. Originally, he came to the Congress at the request of Republicans to speak out against it. He did. And I remember his statements very clearly saying, we don't need the United States to help us or defend us. We can do that ourselves. Well, you know, why don't we take the man at his word? Um, but it certainly is a great opportunity, at least, you know, Israel, that might have been their original thought was, let's just finish this off and just push them into Egypt across the crossing. Egypt won't take them, and King uh, Abdullah and George is not going to take them. Maybe that was, there were some thoughts behind that. But it was also a great opportunity for uh, uh, neocons in both parties and Biden uh, to use this to send more money to Ukraine than, than to Israel, and I don't think that's going to work either. Uh, David, anything you want to jump in with here? Yeah, you know, I had a debate with Elliot on uh, Stephen James' channel the other day, and there's a big mismatch between what Israel wants to do and thinks is going to happen and what's likely to happen, and that's the 
expulsion of Gaza. Like I, I was showing the tablet article just today that's still trying to push uh, you know, pressure on Egypt, saying you know the real problem here is that Egypt won't let Israel expel the Gazans into the Sinai. And uh, Israel's in a big quagmire because in all likelihood, there's two options, and that's either absorption of the Gazans into Israeli society or expulsion. And most Israelis know that and vastly favor expulsion. Although you could say like expulsion is impossible. It's a war crime. It's not going to happen. They're going to fight. They're, they're, you know, hundreds of thousands of them are going to uh, be willing to die other than expulsion. And, you know, Luke knows kind of the facts. Bradley knows the facts. He follows his Israeli media versus the American, you know, kind of like Hasbora to say like Israel, you know, Israeli Jews are kind of like American Jews where it's like, no, Israeli Jews are way far to the right. Um, you know, like even genocidal language, like what Duvid says, um, you know, we should just give all the people in Gaza Israeli citizenship. There's more people in Israel openly advocating for genocide than for that. And of the opinion that uh, somehow this is going to be resolved by pushing them into uh, the Sinai and other nations are going to take them. I would estimate it probably like half of Jews, I mean, half of Israelis, that's what they think is going to happen. And like even Elliot, even like, you know, Nathan Kofnitz are coming up, like, you know, trying to uh, defend that option. In terms of the military, like, you know, so right now the bombing, you know, the, the, say Israel wants to get as many of them out of there as possible before the ground campaign. Um, I was on this channel, Defense Politics Asia, with a global panel of mostly military experts uh, last night. And Israel itself is saying, be ready for 10,000 soldiers to die um, for the invasion in, in Gaza. Not, not just like the bombing, but actually soldier deaths. And they were comparing it to like uh, Vietnam with the tunnels and booby traps or like Rodney saying uh, Stalingrad. Uh, because Hamas has about like 40,000 fighters. Some people estimate between like 20 and 100,000 plus fighters. And even if they were to push the population out and then eventually they have to clear it, um, most military experts would estimate it's going to be like one Israeli death for every two or three uh, Gazan you know, deaths with all the booby traps and tunnels. And even is, is Israel is openly saying that. And a lot of Israelis are, are ready for that. So like you know, when, when the Israeli general said, we're going to do this and it's going to cost 10,000 uh, Jewish lives, uh, a lot of Jews have accepted that. Uh, but that is still basically hinged upon um, the ability to expel the rest of the Gazans someplace else. So it's it's a real disaster. Um, you know, like I pray for de-escalation and, and I've been kind of pushing like they got to absorb those people, give them citizenship. I'm sure Luke would vastly you know, argue about that in like Jewish Voice for Peace, like less than 10 percent of American Jews probably support what I'm saying and probably only like 2 percent of Israeli Jews support what I'm saying. So like, God forbid, there probably is going to be a war and there's probably going to be, um, I mean, so the people on uh, the, the uh, you know, the expert military people said that actually Israel's estimate of 10,000 soldier deaths is low and they're estimating 20 to very 40, low, 20 to 40,000 to say like, that, let's say that there's no Iran or Hezbollah or bombing, but just, just the battle between Israel and Hamas and Gaza, people are estimating it's going to cost 40,000 Jewish soldiers' lives. Uh, Rodney, you want to jump in here? Yeah, I, I think 10,000 is, uh, is, is uh, projecting a lot of hope. I actually think it would probably, uh, uh, they would lose, uh, the IDF would lose, probably three to four, maybe even five for every one Palestinian in Gaza, because they're, they're going into a place that is fundamentally different since they left it, you know, under, I think it was actually Sharon that, you know, handed it over to them of all people, of all uh, prime ministers. And uh, we keep hearing that uh, the IDF has called up 300,000 troops. 90% uh, of that are reservists, uh, which would be equivalent uh, to maybe uh, uh, they don't even aren't even as active as our National Guards are here in the States. So 300,000 troops against, you know, you have a population of of uh, uh, of two million uh, in Gaza. 
and let's just say let's just say for uh, sake of argument that uh, Hamas has 50,000 fighters those 50,000 fighters are going to be able to do a horrific amount of damage uh, because they're they're battle they're battle tested now the wild card is and I suspect this is going to happen as soon as they go into and by the way all of those the show of tanks and all of that tanks don't function well in that type of setting uh again if you look at how many tanks the soviets lost in the battle of berlin and how many tanks both sides lost to stalingrad tanks don't work good <laughs> in urban warfare um so uh uh it's just i mean think uh mogadishu think what happened to us in somalia uh uh on a much grander uh, and much bloodier uh scale and then of course they commit those troops going into gaza can israel and from the point of from the point of view of manpower and logistics support a two-front war hezbollah is a totally different animal up on the north they have an excess of confirmed an excess of a hundred thousand uh, uh but uh of troops uh far more advanced weaponry and uh, I would venture to say that if Hezbollah, if Israel, uh, the IDF commits and goes into Gaza with a majority of their reservists down in the south, Hezbollah would probably go as far as Haifa before Israel could effectively stop them. And then we get into a situation which we're not supposed to know, we're not supposed to acknowledge, but we've been worried about Russians deploying nuclear weapons. I think Israel would be far more apt to deploy nuclear weapons than you know, and if they're having Hezbollah come at them from the north and Hamas uh, tying them down uh, in Gaza, I think they would be more uh, uh, apt to deploy some sort of tactical nuke before Russia uh, ever would. And uh, Rodney, what do you think that the chances are that there'll still be a Jewish state of Israel in 10 years? I'm optimistic, believe it or not. I, I, I really am, um, which is kind of different for me. Uh, but uh, I, I think that cooler heads usually prevail. And, you know, uh, we hear the two uh, scenarios that Dubit brought up, which is true. I've heard them too. Either absorb them all and give them Israeli citizenship. That won't work. I mean, that's just not going to be work. I mean, think about it. Both Netanyahu had a hell of a time after he lost uh, to, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember, uh, Natalie Bennett when he lost to him. Remember, Netanyahu could have stayed in power if he'd have cut a deal with the Arab parties, the Arab Israeli parties, and Natalie Bennett refused. So when you have both the major power blocks refusing to make, you know, to basically cut a deal, to become prime minister with the, uh, you know, the Arab uh, is Palestine. That goes to show you the state of affairs. That's where the apartheid stuff comes, uh, criticisms come from leveled against Israel. I mean, you know, we can say, oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Well, there are certainly some shades of it uh, there. So you're not going to be able to absorb. And also there's the demographic issue. Are you going to give all of those Gazans and uh, uh, Palestinians on the, uh, on the West Bank Israeli citizenship? That fundamentally changes. And the only time Jews want to change the demographics of a country is if it's someplace else but Israel. That's just fact uh, by their own statements. So that's not going to work. You're not going to uh, expel them either. That's not going to work. I mean, uh, you know, they're already having you know, problems regardless of the statements about, pro. you know, we stand with Israel. But the whole time, I mean, here you got Biden saying, don't let your rage guide you. And the same thing's coming out of Europe. Fact is, both sides need a state. And they both need to be a state with self-determination. And Israel, you know, uh, uh, the Palestinians have got to stop firing rockets and engaging in terrorist activities in Israel. And Israel can't be blockading the Palestinian state and starving them out. Uh, so... That's a solution. And we keep hearing that two state solution, two state solution. And uh, they're going to have to at some point, And what I think I saw a, a, a really interesting article. It happened here in the United States, though, where uh, there was a, a young Arab. I think it was a teenager. I can't remember the age, but this uh, I, don't, I think may have been Palestinian was murdered 
much like the rabbi was up in, in, in Detroit. And two uh, Jewish rabbis went to the funeral. And that got me to thinking, what happens if we start making the parents, Israeli parents, go to the funerals of the dead Palestinian kids and Palestinians go to the funerals of dead Israeli kids? At some point, you have to you know, realize that your children aren't, you know, it's not worth this political BS anymore. That's one of my biggest fundamental issues against war at all is it's always you know, the, the chicken hawks are always screaming, you know, to send somebody else's kids and grandkids a fight. Both sides are going to have to come to the conclusion that they've lost enough children and grandchildren and they want it to stop. And I, I kind of think that might uh, that might happen. And I also saw an interesting article, I think Drudge posted, Luke, where the press in Israel is now feeling intimidated by publishing anything other than the, you know, the screaming war cries and the extremist stuff that we hear from among Israelis sometimes uh, the Duba talked about. So at some point you think that, uh, you know, but again, it always has to get worse before it gets better. And I'm just kind of a little concerned about what that worse is. I certainly don't want the U.S. entangled, you know, in all this. I, I think people... We hear people talking about the founding fathers. Well, George Washington was the first to say, stay out of foreign entanglements. And yet he's been disregarded throughout the, uh, you know, throughout the last you know, two centuries since he died. We get entangled with Europe, which we didn't need to. We get entangled in the Middle East, NATO, all of this stuff. Why should we care if two countries are fighting when there's absolutely no national interest to the United States? I mean, Turkey and Greece, just to digress a little bit, are NATO allies, and they're always on the verge to war, of war. So how, who are we going to side in NATO if, if, if Greece and Turkey go at it? We have to just have to pick one? They're both NATO members. We're supposed to defend both of them. Are we going to deploy troops to, you know, to defend Turkey and Greece against one another? I mean, this is nuts. Uh, David, anything you want to say? Yeah, I mean, there's, God forbid, real possibilities of uh, World War III. And if you saw, like, I was seeing yesterday the uh, Russian, uh, your Dagestani uh, MMA fighters that just, like, dominating the the division's MMA. They were all, like, draped in Palestinian flags. They dedicated their victory. One of them even said, like, after the fight, like, send me to Palestine. Give me a weapon and send me to Palestine. Um and these protests, like, uh, you know, like, God forbid, like, the, the numbers are, are swelling hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands. Um, however, if the U.S. stays steady in not even necessarily going to war, but just can't, containing the battle, so it's just Israel versus Gaza, um, still, like, the Israeli side only works for the war. It only makes sense if they're going to be able to successfully expel the Palestinians. I think, I mean, Luke agrees that I'm not sure, maybe I'll put it straight to Luke, but uh, my impression is that the majority of Israelis right now think that they're, that they have a decent chance of expelling the Palestinians and even like American uh, right-wing publication, uh, even somewhat mainstream leftist Americans are somewhat softly backing the expulsion. Then it gets into questions uh, like, God forbid, what we first started talking with Rodney also about World War II and the Holocaust uh, functionalist versus uh, instrumentalist is did the Holocaust start as an expulsion and when that didn't work turn into a genocide and uh, you know I also add that uh, most military experts believe that the bombing that Israel's doing serves no military purpose it's not helping destroy Hamas uh, the rockets everything's underground uh, mostly civilians being killed and uh, you know so why is Israel doing it you know one would be because well Israel doesn't want to lose lives, and it's kind of just like revenge, or do, they're doing the best with the technology they have because they know if they go in with troops, it's going to cost countless Israeli lives. And also because, like they said, they want to force an evacuation. As of now, Israel still has the order for an evacuation. They're still calling hospitals and other things and saying, you got to get out or we're going to bomb you. And uh, they're moving them into refugee camps within Israel. I think now there's 300,000 in one of them of people that have actually left. And, uh, you know, so I'll put it to you, Luke. I mean, do you agree that the majority of Israelis and even a sizable chunk of American Jews right now think that maybe they are going to somehow be able to get away with expelling them and pushing them into Egypt or getting foreign nations to take them? 
I, I don't believe so, and I haven't seen any any serious argument in that direction from any mainstream Jewish press, whether in, in America or in Israel. Now, would most Israelis prefer the Palestinians to disappear? Yes. <laughs> but I, I don't, don't think most Israelis believe that they can forcefully expel the, the Palestinians. Uh, Rodney, I thought it was absolutely bizarre that Joe Biden visited Israel uh, th this week. There, there's absolutely no strategic or American interest that would argue for him doing so. The only possible reason that I can come up with that he visited Israel was for the sake of his own ego. H how do you understand Joe Biden's visit to Israel this past week? Well, you know, he didn't accomplish anything. The so-called 20 aid trucks that he said was going to go into Gaza, he said he secured that. Um, that hasn't happened. He said they had to fix the road. Well, that's because in the immediate, you know, after of October 7th, the Israeli Air Force bombed that gate. Uh, we don't hear too much about it, but they, the Israeli Air targeted that gate and blew that gate up. And uh, But you don't need to fix a highway to get aid trucks in. Has anybody ever seen these military transport trucks? They do quite well off-road. So in 20 trucks, being so that was all BS. I don't think it was ego, Luke. I think it was pure politics, which was kind of bizarre, too. Like he needs to shore up the Jewish vote. 68 percent of the Jewish vote voted for him anyway, even though Donald Trump was the one that moved the embassy to Jerusalem. They have little communities named after him, but still 68 percent of the Jewish vote, as I recall, Luke, or maybe it was a little higher still went to Joe Biden. So he doesn't need to shore that up by by any means. Now, it could be an attempt to, you know, cut into the evangelical vote, but they're not going to vote for him. So I think it was p political. And he likes to brag that he was the first U.S. president to go into a war zone. That's not true. Franklin Roosevelt was. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt went to North Africa shortly after U.S. troops landed in 1942. And uh, there's a famous picture of him in the back of a Jeep. So, I mean, he even lied about that. Uh, but uh, so, uh, and then he couldn't get, uh, uh, a boss wouldn't take his phone call. Uh, Al-Sisi just promptly canceled through his foreign minister. And I remember somebody kept him waiting eight hours. Uh, I can't remember who that was. And then, of course, the King Qatar. of Jordan, uh, was, uh, the King of it was Saudi Arabia and Qatar, that, that was Blinken, not Biden. Oh, okay, Blinken. Okay, well, I mean, this this is all rather uh, bizarre. It's almost uh, as if uh, you know Joe Biden saying one thing, um, and uh, well, you're uh, missing the, actually the other effect. I think you're missing the the reality of how close expulsion was to happen and still might be. And uh, Biden was going one thing to show unequivocal support for Israel. You know, Israel's uh, U you know U.S. has Israel's back. And Biden probably feels like that, you know, despite his democratic value, like, you know, he would be a military warrior on behalf of Israel. The funding Biden, you know, unabashedly just requested $16 billion more in weapons. And at the time when he went, he was supposed to have the meeting of Egypt and Jordan. And it might have also been the UAE, but the other nation was less uh, instrumental in uh, in the meeting. And, and it was supposed to be about the humanitarian corridor that uh, you know biden was basically saying like look hamas attacked israel has a right to defend themselves go in and destroy hamas and what they need to do is cooperate in creating the humanitarian corridor and biden was supposed to negotiate with egypt to make that humanitarian corridor in the sinai peninsula and then the hospital bombing happened and jordan and egypt um you probably saw that uh, you're like, no, the U.S. was going to be complicit in war crimes. And uh, but I think you're missing how close this uh, forced expulsion was. And well, let's, let's talk about that for a little bit. Agent. I mean, you agree that, that you Biden, know? Biden went there to create a humanitarian corridor and he went to pressure Egypt to make that humanitarian corridor in the Sinai Peninsula. I think that was part of the meeting was supposed to be between Biden and he was going to meet with uh, Al Sisi in Egypt and King Abdullah in Jordan and a boss of the Palestinian Authority. Okay, uh, Al Sisi and, and King Abdullah promptly quit. They gave an excuse that there has to be three days of mourning. Okay, let's take that. 
Uh, but why would he even meet with a boss? A boss's party is not in charge of Gaza. The, you know, the, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of his party right offhand. But, you know, the Palestinians uh, are not a monolith by, by any means. They have their different versions. And a boss is like 90 years old. I mean, he's probably as effective today as Paul von Hindenburg was effective in 1933 in Germany. I yeah, mean, Fatah. This is, this Fatah. Is, I, his party is named Fatah. Fatah. Yeah, Fatah. And he is 87, yeah. I believe. Okay. So, uh, again, it, it, none of it made any sense other than, keep in mind, Joe Biden himself is facing, I keep calling it the, the Paul von Hindenburg look. Joe Biden's facing that, too, and this could have been an attempt also politically to show, oh, he's a wartime president. He's flying into war zones. Look how sexy Joe Biden is. He'll come up and sniff your hair if you don't believe us. I mean, it, it was all rather bizarre because nothing was accomplished. Nothing has been accomplished. And then, of course, after Joe Biden did it, then Gavin Newsom had to say that he was going to. Well, we know what that's all about. That's just being an attention, and you can fill in the second word. Well, that uh, it's happened. just, I mean, what are you talking about? Like Biden, Blinken and Biden both sat in the Israeli war meeting. They both uh, did whatever power they could without the Congress to replenish weapons. And they got Biden to come home and make a speech to America requesting $16 billion in funds. I mean, so the, the perspective is like, you're, you mean, because the narrative of like, you know, Biden being anti Israel um, is saying like, no, I mean, Biden is oh i didn't say biden was anti-israel i'm saying like well of course there was an accomplishment biden unequivocally backed israel he sent um well, of he course sent, he sent the the naval fleets into the mediterranean he publicly basically warned uh the other nations that if you jump in this america will will go to war for the half of israel so i'm saying i don't know what you're talking about and biden wanted to bully um the arab nations and that's like so they backed out biden they, can't bully anybody well, I mean, Let's talk about know, the deployment of the fleet. The, the USS Eisenhower was already you're scheduled to be there. Biden as the person, but Biden as the commander in chief of the U.S. Army, Biden was there to bully Egypt and Jordan, and and I'm claiming that he was there. Like the real intention was to bully. I mean, it's even stated explicitly was the creation of the humanitarian corridor into the Sinai Peninsula. And so you're just looking at Biden as the weak leader, which he might be, but he's still commander in chief. Okay, okay, to... David, David, we got the point. It's it's clear. Uh, Ren, uh, Rodney, please, please respond. Okay, when was the last time, Luke? I mean, I, I think I have the correct answer. You can Google it. But when was the last time there was a mass so-called expulsion? It was the partition of India and Pakistan. That was the last time in history there has been that would be this significant of an expulsion for people when actually, you know, the Indians that, you know, we're not going to pair well in Pakistan and vice versa. There was this huge transfer of population. And we see the few Muslim Pakistani, you know, the Muslims became Pakistan and the Hindu. And we see how well those that didn't leave, you know, the Muslims that didn't leave, families didn't leave in 1948, 40, whenever that was, uh, are faring today in India. But that was the last time. And it didn't look, it was not a good look. Uh, times have changed. I don't know, you know, I, I agree I'm sure there are many people, even people on the Israeli left, that would love to see that happen. But the reality of that happen, it's just not. I mean, if you think the college campuses are blowing up now uh, to actually forcibly engage in such a tactic, which is, is it's a war crime, it's ethnic cleansing, it's everything. I don't, you know, and then you got to think also, again, I go back to cooler heads. Uh, Israel already deals with that apartheid label being stuck to them all the time even by people uh yeah is egypt expelled population in the 1950s that's about the same time but not on this scale not on the scale of the pakistani uh uh in india uh partition and not on this scale i mean israel would have no choice if they expel the two or three million that are in gaza they would have to do in the west bank as well there's more, I think, isn't there more Palestinians in the West Bank? And that is a much greater danger. You have that many people and you get them all ticked off over there. And you know, the West Bank has actually been relatively quiet during all of this. If you want to get them riled up and have them flog into Jerusalem, which they have the numbers to do it, just start 
ethnically cleansing, cleansing Gaza. So again, I think there are people that would like to do it. I think the idea has even been floated. But I think, again, cooler heads say we can't get away with that. Now, another option could be uh, for Israel to do with the Palestinians what the United States did to the Native Americans, to the Indians, and create reservations. But it seems like they kind of tried some sort of version of that Gaza now, and it's not working. Uh, you know, keep in mind that uh, Indians didn't have uh, citizenship when the reservations were first created. That came later as a Supreme Court ruling. In fact, they got uh, voting rights and citizen, you know, full voting rights before even women. So it, it's oh, a that, mess. That, that makes and, sense. Uh, like I said, I go- <laughs> uh, yeah. But here's a, here's a new direction for the conversation. The current situation, Luke, is the, the current, uh, current situation has been going on for 50 plus years, as hot as it is. It can't continue. At some point, this is going to have to be used as a way to fundamentally change it and fix it. Or they're just going to be wiping each other out. And I don't know how many much how much stomach either side is oh. going to have for this much. Longer. Yeah, I mean, the, the war is going to go on until one side wipes out the, the other or, or drives the other out. So which either side... When you get a winner, it will be the, the winner will, will drive out or decimate the loser. But the, the big winner in all of this, it seems to me, obviously, is Russia. Uh, America is not going to be able to sustain the same kind of aid to Ukraine. Ukraine's getting virtually no attention in the news media. What do you think about that angle, Rodney? Well, what's fascinating is I don't know how much, you know, there was an article in Sti- Stars and Stripes, and I still read that. Uh, and this was probably six months ago, maybe less, where, you know, in between these congressional appropriations, the United States had been really digging into its own reserves in terms of stockpiles that it's supposed to have in case it has to, in case of another 9-11 or something like that. I don't know how much we could give you know, without really depleting our ability to do something. And of course, we've already let Five million plus people in from other countries along the border. So what happens if those people actually start just going to the, you know, going to a gun show and buying guns and start doing stuff? But you're right. Um, also, following up that Stars and Stripes article, there was an article out this week that the United States Department Department of Defense has been leaning on on arms uh, manufacturers to kind of hurry up and get stuff uh, uh, done. And of course, they have supply chain issues and manpower issues as well. So I don't know how much we could give either side, but certainly we're not going to be able to, you know, be the. And I, by the way, before Biden's speech, I was talking to my son and I said, I bet you 20 bucks that tonight he mentions the arsenal of democracy and echoes Roosevelt, because that was Roosevelt's position in, in, in selling the lend lease to supply uh, without going to war, but to supply Britain. And sure enough, Biden said it. But, I, you know, we're not the same country because, you know, we're just not that we were back in 1939 and 1940. Uh, but uh, I, certainly uh, if he's going to have to pick one. Uh, Israel would be the logical one. It's a different type of a different type of war. They're not fighting, uh, uh, you know, a behemoth modern army. Uh, so that would be the likelihood. And I don't think Congress is going to allow uh, him to bootstrap funds for Ukraine. And by the way, that speech, you know, Duba talked about, he gave a primetime speech. If you count the actual sentences, he opened up stoking the fears about Israel, but almost probably, Luke, 80 percent of that speech was about Ukraine, 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 Ukraine. He's trying to bootstrap Ukraine onto Israel. And at some point, Congress is going, when they get a speaker, keep in mind, there can't be any bills done until there's a speaker. Uh, I hope there isn't a speaker for a long time because the American people are far better off when that thing's not working because Congress and Biden only work for other countries. They don't work for our people anymore. But anyway, make a long story short, they're going to have to pick. Biden's going to have to pick Ukraine uh, or Israel, and uh, he's going to pick Israel. And this hasn't gotten much media attention, but it, it moved me. As as Biden was leaving Israel, he sang this beautiful song, I can't forget this evening or your face as you are leaving, but I guess that's just the way the story goes. He, he said to Bibi, I can't live if living is without you. I can't live. I can't give any more. Well, 
th- there are limits to how much America can, can give. And America shifted a whole lot of munitions from Israel to Ukraine, and that can't continue. Uh, America can't fulfill both Israel and Ukraine's need for munitions. And if I were China, this would be the time that I would invade Taiwan. I mean, well, America sure. is I so mean, overmatched. Go ahead. Yeah. I, uh, I had long said, Luke, that if China takes Taiwan, the United States will do absolutely nothing because China has nukes. And let me tell you, the United States won't do uh, uh, anything. The American public, both sides won't do anything. If, just think of the economic devastation of a nuke. Just say country A, doesn't matter if it's China, it could be Pakistan. They have nukes and they're not very stable these days. If anybody were to land one nuke, say, in a major city in the United States, think about the economic, or anywhere for that matter, what it would do. It would literally almost fold our tent. If you think the COVID shutdowns destroy the economy, just a mere possibility of, of a nuke hitting uh, someplace in the United States, especially a major city, um, that's it. There's no guns for it. And then I also remember Israel getting criticized and bullied as Duba talked about, by the United States to send arms and supplies to Ukraine. It did not. It kind of stayed out of that. Uh, and I think Israel's better off for that because had they sent, uh, you know, they had they stripped their stockpiles and sent tanks and aircraft and munitions to Ukraine, uh, you know, we're, people are already complaining. Why haven't they invaded? It's been, what, 10 days. Why haven't they invaded Gaza? Why haven't they invaded Gaza? And I hear that predominantly among evangelicals and, and kosher conservatives. Think about it. They're, they wouldn't be able to do anything uh, if, they'd have, if they'd have made the commitments to Ukraine that the United States wanted them to. Uh, David, anything you want to jump in with? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you want to talk about... Uh... Frame games, conspiracy theories, also uh, that might be interesting. But you know, the, to close the chapter on Israel, like you know, people are judging Israel based maybe on the American Jews they know versus uh, you know what the Israeli Absolutely. politicians are actually saying. Um, you know, like uh, you know, people are in disbelief about uh, you know the neo kahanist uh, Smadrik and Ben Gavir, and say like, no, I mean that attitude is pretty common there, and even like Likud, and uh, they already have mobilized. 300,000 troops that are outside Gaza just waiting for the call. They already have uh, the IDF conducting raids, basically locked down on the West Bank. Israel is basically mobilized the whole country for an all-out war against whoever might join in. And, uh, you know, thinking like the protest or the public pressure, um, you know, like Vietnam, I I mean, it was before my time, but I understand there was like over a million people protesting in Washington, D.C., like the protests against Vietnam were way bigger than this Palestine stuff. And it lasted uh, years, uh, like the you know Democratic Convention of the 60s or whatever that was. But, uh, you know, just saying, like, look at the protest and the public pressure. Consider uh, what happened during Vietnam and the U.S. continued with the war despite all the public pressure. And there's way more interest in Israel than there was in Vietnam. And then you know, God forbid, the last point would be the sustained violence on the Jewish community. Like, I mean, God forbid my friend Sam Wool, if she was killed related to this war, that Israel could conduct the war, the U.S. elites could continue to support the war, the Jewish community elites could continue to support the war, and there will be also a high level of casualties and displacement to the Jewish community in Um, America because, uh, you know, these protests will continue to grow. Uh, The Palestinians will see that the main reason Israel is able to do this is the support of the U.S. government. They're not going to be able to convince the U.S. government not to do it, and therefore they're going to attack the Jewish community. So if there is a sustained war of months, um, the Jewish community should be ready for a sustained um, violence against us. Uh, Rodney, are China's interests or Iran's interests advanced by this conflict in between Israel and Hamas? Polit- I don't know where ch- China. China's interests. Ch- oh, so China is advanced point, by uh, uh, the right. fact that. Hang on, David. They, hang on, they, David. They, Let Rodney go. Go, Rodney. They know exactly what you just said, Luke. That the United States is committing 
is wants to commit now to fund and basically, well, they're not just funding the wars and on, on two different wars, but keep in mind, we're also paying for all of the civil administration, governmental administration, retirement benefits of Ukraine. Ukraine is the de facto a, a U.S. you know protectorate, and so we're we're not just funding their military; we're funding everything. Uh, so, uh, and then if we would do this with Israel, uh, you know, uh, Xi Jinping can just walk across uh, the, uh, you know, the Taiwan Straits and just take Taiwan. And there won't be anything we can do about it. Nor do I think, even if we weren't doing this, we would do anything. I know Biden made the statement that if China invaded Taiwan, he would go to war with China. That isn't going to happen, and it definitely can. So, from that point, of, Iran. Now, what's been interesting is Biden, uh, this is another thing, uh, talking about the hypocrisy. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Fox News conservatives and neocons of all sides have been trying to link Iran to this. So let's go ahead and take out the Palestinians. Let's take out Iran. Uh, let's uh, refreeze. You know, we made a deal for this six billion bucks. Uh, that was actually their money anyway. It wasn't taxpayers' money. And uh, let's, re, uh, let's refreeze that. And let's take out Iran. And Biden, you know, uh, Biden has said that they've not, and so has the intel community has said that they don't see any, you know, connect the dots, you know, between Iran guiding this uh, or having any say in this. And I tend to believe that because it's just not, that's not in Iran's interest. Uh, and uh, it, it's interesting that the, uh, uh, the intel community, for some respects, are are considered corrupt and uh, non, uh, you know, not reliable by uh, by these Fox News and neocon conservatives. But in some respects, if it involves Iran, well, yes, yes, they are. We have to go by uh, we we have to go by uh, what, what they say. It, it's a mess. I, Iran's uh, interest is is clearly, you know, uh, political. It is sought to be the leader of the Islamic world, and. Uh, you know, uh, it routinely, you know, it's just part of its propaganda, death to America, the end of the Zionist regime and all of that. But I don't, you know, Iran has been very calculating. Uh, their, you know, their, their air force is, you know, 1970s planes. They really, they're, they're not a military powerhouse per se. Where they have excelled is, is training and arming, you know, guerrilla fighters. Like, you know, they were instrumental Suleimani, even though we killed him, which was stupid, was instrumental in defeating ISIS. He actually made an effective Iraqi fighting force, uh, something that the United States couldn't do in either Iraq or Afghanistan, trained them, armed them, and, uh, you know, stopped the advance of ISIS on Baghdad and then drove them out of the, out of the country. A lot of that was Suleimani and the Iranians. They've learned to do that very, very well. And yes, do they fund and send arms to uh, Hamas uh, and Hezbollah? Hezbollah definitely yes, and I think Hamas has been filtering it uh, out of out of Hezbollah. But uh, I uh, there was a couple of articles out of the Middle East and out of Europe that said that their intel sources had said that the uh, the Ayatollah was actually caught off guard, was surprised by the action. That was kind of codified because the the heads of Hamas all live in Qatar. Qatar was the one that got the first hostages released, by the way, had said that they've been planning this for two years, 24 months, which is about right to, to plan this type of, you know, uh, an invasion by a guerrilla army into, you know, an advanced first world state with a modern army. And that they could, he said he could count on one hand, five fingers, how many people were actually in the know and they were all Hamas and they weren't even necessarily all of the Hamas's political uh, leadership, which is interesting to note. Both Hezbollah and Hamas has a political leadership, and they have a military wing. And those, oftentimes, those hands don't know what the other two, what the other one's doing. And uh, did you follow the news about Frame Game Radio being unmasked as Mike Mike Benz? No, I didn't know that. Oh, do you remember the Frame Game Radio character? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the one that said he. he then he disappeared out of the yeah. blue, right? Yeah, yeah. How was well, he unmasked? Well, he's a conservative crusader against online censorship, so he hid his face in 2017, 2018. But he set up this uh, foundation for internet freedom, and his real name is uh, Mike Benz, 
and uh, he's got uh, a lot of very influential uh, followers and uh, he's got an organization for internet freedom he's uh, connected to representative Jim Jordan uh, connect, seems to have some kind of connection to Elon Musk uh, so interesting trajectory that he's he's been on he was the lawyer right yes well it turns out he's not a lawyer wait where, where do you no, see well, I said a lawyer? That, if you remember Luke I don't think he's actually a lawyer. I'm not sure if you looked at his uh, profile, but I think that actually he wasn't honest about it. He's not actually a lawyer. Okay, uh, Rodney. Yeah, I, I called that up. I, I remember, Luke, on your show, I said I didn't think he was an actual lawyer because some of his, uh, it, shall we say, interpretations were grossly uh, in conflict with actual case law. But th that doesn't matter. It's interesting. I've never heard of this guy, Ben. So I just remember okay. that he disappeared. So here, here's the news article. So. Winter 2018, he took a job as an assistant secretary for public affairs at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. He was writing speeches for Secretary Ben Carson. He left in 2020. He went to the Department of State, where he held the position of deputy assistant secretary for international communications, information technology for less than a year. He has a background in law, and he did a short stint in government. He became a cyber expert, offered his opinion to a new group of lawmakers, activists, and journalists fighting against what they deem the censorship industrial complex. In April 2022, he started the Foundation for Freedom Online, and he has gotten connected with a bunch of people like Matt Taibbi, Michael Schellenberger, uh, Elon Musk, uh, and uh, he's been widely cited. So he's, uh, he's quite made something of himself since he was the Frame Game Radio personality. Well, how did he, was he, was he outed or did he admit that's who he was? I'm kind of curious. Yeah, he was outed. He was essentially outed by Richard Spencer in 2018, uh, it turns out, but no one really paid that much of attention. And then I guess a lot of people in the know, I guess Ricardo knew, but uh, he just became publicly outed in uh, a month ago by NBC News, by Brandy Zadrozny. And uh, Colin Liddell says, Frame Games was unmasked by Richard Spencer in some kind of deal. I, I don't know if that's true, but uh, Richard did unmask and dox Frame Game back in 2018. But it, that didn't seem to uh, be widely known until NBC News published this expose. Why would Spencer dox somebody like that? They, you know, I, I don't know. Oh, that's right. Spencer became a liberal after all. Never mind. Thanks. Right. So anyway... <laughs> um, uh, Mike Benz now explains that what he was doing as Frame Game Radio is he was trying to de-radicalize people on the alt-right. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Which seems like a, uh, a post facto justification. But uh, anyway. An investigative uh, journalist contacted me on Friday about Frame Games, and we spoke for like two hours. Okay. What was the what were some of the highlights of that conversation? Um. She knew very little about the alt-right. So she has this huge conspiracy theory that Frame Games is behind the Twitter files leak and behind Ban the ADL and doing illegal activity and is some sort of mastermind in current possibly illegal activity. If you notice, like he was behind, I guess, uh, Schellenberger for whatever at one of these uh, uh, congressional hearings. He was right behind him. And she claims he was like feeding him what to say, convincing him to lie to uh, Congress. And she thinks that he was involved with Elon Musk from the beginning of Twitter and the coordinated attack against Ban the ADL was masterminded by Frame Games. So, like, when the docs came out, she was already doing investigative journalism on Ben's. And when the docs came out, so I had done this tweet that she found in 2018 claiming that frame games is q and like i didn't know anything about him i mean if he was actually in the trump administration or had some sort of connections or was some sort of you know rodney cia uh you know a psyop or something like that um retired retired but i mean she was not necessarily so concerned uh with you know what he did as frame games or what he said um but she was she thinks that he's currently a criminal that needs to be stopped and is this big mastermind in stuff that's going on in Twitter, in Congress, um, 
right now. So like she was very interested in the history and I gave her like all history lesson of like internet blood sports and the alt right. And, you know, she also said Frank James is half Italian, half Jewish. And uh, they've even like looked into his parents and questioned his parents about his Jewish upbringing. Some people think he might've lied completely about being Jewish and he still might be lying about being Jewish. Uh, and the question is, was it all like a coordinated strategy back from frame games where he was building the network uh, to take down the ADL or certain elements in the censorship Biden administration. And uh, you know, basically did that as a psyop to build the network. And then when Elon Musk took over the network, he used his connections that he had built up then as some sort of coordinated effort to take down uh, you know, the uh, powerful forces in the State Department through Twitter files and then eventually uh, banned the ADL and till today. So if you look at this woman, Kristen Ruby, and I actually told her, like, you got to speak to Luke Ford. Like, if you want, like, I told her, uh -oh. I didn't, like, dox anybody, but I was like, yeah, I told her how I spoke to him and the information, like, I thought in my views that he was kind of like a racist Jew, uh, typical of kind of like alt writers and, you know, questions about funding and Halsey's funding. Was there a conspiracy? And uh, I said, if you want, you know, like, if you want more information, you got to ask Luke Ford. And I was trying to understand her conspiracy theories. But the interesting part I thought was, you know, say, like, you know, we're not just talking about a dox of somebody, uh, you know, years ago that uh, said questionable things, uh, that it may have actually been a psyop, and he might actually be, uh, you know, at the center of uh, some sort of uh, uh, major conspiracy involving, uh, you know, serious political actors, uh, billionaires, powerful people. Okay. Did he ever even identify as Jewish, Luke? I don't remember yes. that. But yeah. I he did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't even remember that. You, you know, this 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 investigative journalist, all these conspiracy it sounds like to me she's just trying to do a hit job where she throws the proverbial a whole bunch of poo against the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, ahead, I, mean, I don't know so much about like say the Twitter files or ban the ADL. And I mean you I don't know, we talked a little bit about ban the ADL, but to say that you could ban the ADL have been astroturfing and we know frame games like even luke you have on your channel frame games on your channel bashing the adl saying that they're basically a criminal cabal and that uh your know, frame games could have been the mastermind working for elon musk to take down um the adl and i said that, that that's plausible and i don't know i mean she's looking at it as a criminal conspiracy and i said like well i don't mean necessarily know if he committed any where's crime. the crime where's the crime well, and that's what she's I'm saying trying to... but i mean it, the crime would have been that that uh, she that he uh, fed false information to like Schoenberger or these other people to lie before Congress. Um, okay. but, uh, I think that's is enough. It, is it, okay. that it sounds like, it sounds that... like they're trying to do another Douglas Mackey is what they're trying to do. Would you speak to this journalist, Luke? I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Um, and do you think it's possible that frame games, uh, you know, Mike Benz is a serious player and was involved in, uh, you know, like a, a, a senior advisor to Elon Musk and maybe is the one who told Elon Musk, uh, uh, you, you know, to go with the band, the L ADL and said, we could beat these guys. We could take them down or even. The yeah. Twitter yeah. Loop. I think that's possible that uh, he's a serious player and that he might have, you know, influence with people like Elon Musk. Yeah. I, I think that's possible.